Straight Edges Chapter 14 of Mice and Men and Mosquitoes, Part 2 On the question of a loving God and a hell, there's the guy who says, If he wants us to choose him, why doesn't he try harder? Why doesn't he make it plainer that he exists? There are a bunch of answers to that one, mostly along the lines of, What more do you want? And whatever it is, it's been tried and didn't do any good anyway. At least not for those who just plain do not want to believe. People can find a way around any kind of evidence. But the answer I want to talk about here is this one. Faith. The Bible tells us that without it, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. It's also this matter of faith that explains why we must choose God this side of the grave if it's to do us any good. You may have noticed that I kept referring last chapter to the grave and to the necessity of choosing God before our time is up. Why is that such a big deal? Why do some Christians believe that there are no second chances after death? Again, faith. I think faith and freedom are twins that must go hand in hand. After we die, we'll know one way or the other, won't we? I mean, we will if I'm right. If the annihilist is right, if there is no conscious life after death, then we'll never know. In which case, nothing I'm saying here matters. Nothing anyone could say about anything matters very much. But if I'm right, it matters. Now, if we do know the truth about all this when we die, if we do see God with our blindfolds off, could we still choose him freely? No, we could only choose to choose him, or, in other words, we'd have no choice. Even from the little we can deduce about God, do you really think, in being face to face with the reality of him, any of us could stand up before him and coolly say, No thanks, I don't need any help, I can manage, thank you. I don't think any one of us would be standing up at all, never mind saying anything of the sort. So if there is to be any freedom, if there are to be any real choices, they must happen right here in the uncertainty of earth. And it must be uncertain. By faith, I mean the acceptance of things that are not proven absolutely to us. Sure, I suppose God could write the fact of his existence across the sky in bold letters for all the world to see. Oh, wait, he's tried that. Looked at the stars lately? I suppose he could speak to us from out of the clouds in language we could understand. Tried that, too. I mean, I suppose he could overwhelm all of us with his presence until we couldn't stand before him. And he will someday. But where would be our freedom in that? I think in his insistence on faith, his insistence on our choosing him in spite of our uncertainty and our not hearing clearly from him, we can see the importance of this matter of our freedom and of our freely choosing him. This life is the exam and we don't know all the answers. If we did, there would be no point to the exam. If there is to be an element of choice at all, there must be an element of the unknown for us. Speaking of exams, have you ever had to take one of those silly tests that claim to show how carefully you read and how well you follow instructions? At the beginning, it says something like, Do not begin this test until you've read it all through. Then it goes through pages and pages of difficult and impossible questions, and the final one says something like, Don't answer any questions other than this one. Did you read all the questions before you started? Of course, most people ignore the first instruction and struggle away through the pages and pages, wondering why a select few are sitting there grinning with their tests turned over. Then they get to the last question, but ah, it's too late and they've already failed the test. If you like, there's a parallel here. In this test of life, there are millions of hard questions. We do have to attempt them all, but there's really only one that's the clincher. There's only one that determines if we pass or fail. The test is so hard, and we're such backward students that none of us has a hope without this one question. A lot of us, like me, struggle through getting 10 or 20% right, and that's a high estimate. Maybe some basically decent persons get pretty close. Maybe an absolute saint might get 80 or 90, but the passing grade is 100%. There's a much-used illustration that shows how inadequate that 80 or 90% is, in a broad jump, I might be able to pull off a distance of about three feet. Let's make you an exceptional jumper and assign you a superhuman ability of about 40 feet. Now, if you and I are perched on the edge of the Grand Canyon, who's going to come closer to jumping across it? You will, right? By a whole 37 feet. You might feel very good about yourself and your jumping ability if you were just competing with me. After all, you can jump more than 10 times my distance but those 37 feet don't really amount to much in light of the Grand Canyon. 
in light of God's perfection, whether we're very bad mice or very good ones, whether we get 10 or 20 percent or 80 or 90, none of it matters very much. On the exam of life, there's only one question you must answer right, and that question will give you the perfect grade you need that you can't get any other way. When the time's up and the teacher calls for us to hand in our papers, there's really only one question he's looking to see if we got right. If that one was answered correctly, he takes his red pen and marks a big A, 100% at the top of the page and erases all the wrong answers and fills them in for us himself. That one question we must answer right is this, will you let me write this test for you? You've asked me, or I've asked myself, I mean, how I could believe in a loving God and a hell at the same time. Are you beginning to see the answer? Here we have a God who hates sin, who hates what we do, what we all do, more than I hate mice or mosquitoes, but does he write us off? Does he destroy us in a mass? No, he takes the surprising route of tolerating past endurance, the things he hates, in the hope that we'll learn to hate them too, and let him get rid of those things for us. Then he's found a way at great cost to himself, more on that in later chapters, to get rid of our sin and turn us into his much-loved children so we can live in his presence and enjoy him forever. I can't have mice in my house forever, and he can't have sinners with him forever. So we have to become something else. We have to have our natures transformed. When I try to stretch the analogy of my rodent problem to include the reality of what God does for us, I just have to laugh. It's ridiculous to think of me not only tolerating the mice in my house, but loving them and finding a way to get rid of their mousy natures and habits so they can live with me forever. No one would do it. No one but God, that is. As ridiculous as it would be for me to turn my pests into pets, it's ridiculouser, almost as ridiculous as that non-word, for him to do what he does. My mice analogy breaks down at this point simply because what God does beggars analogy. There's nothing like it that's ever been seen or attempted before. Imagine opening a wildlife preserve in your house for mice and snakes and cockroaches. Imagine opening a blood bank for mosquitoes. Then you'll have a little better understanding of why Christians talk about God's grace and call it amazing. They might almost as well call it ridiculous grace. It goes so beyond reason. Now, it's true that to God we are not what rodents and insects are to me. We do have great worth and value to him, and that worth and value says a whole lot more about what he's like than it does about what I'm like. I have great worth and value because of the price God assigned to me, because of what he was willing to pay. A lot of people talk as though it's easy to believe God loves us. Why wouldn't he, after all? But that it's ridiculous to believe in hell. It's a far bigger stretch to see why God should love us. The hell part isn't ridiculous at all. The lengths God goes to to keep us from going there are. If all else I've reasoned about God is true, I have to believe in hell. If I believe he allows us to follow through on our own choices, I have to believe that not everyone will be able to spend eternity in his presence. I know beyond doubt that eternity completely removed from God's presence will be hell. There's another obvious objection I should probably mention here. It's the obvious objection that none of us are capable of being anything other than what we are. Mice can't help doing what mice do. Mosquitoes are what they are by nature. On the one hand, Christians are always placing the responsibility for a person's actions on the person, but then turning around and saying that he never stood any chance of being perfect anyway. I mean, all Christians will admit that everyone sins, that none of us can do much besides sin. Next, we admit that God judges a person for his sin. Still, we believe that God is just and only does what's fair. Is it fair to judge someone for something she can't help? If all of us have sin in our natures passed on to us by the original pair of sinners, why are we judged when we're not to blame? Before we can really sink our teeth into that question, we first need to decide if the Christian doctrine of a hereditary sin nature is a viable one. Even when I phrase it like that, hereditary sin nature, it sounds like a bad mix between theology and science fiction. But it is a Christian doctrine that, for some reason and in some way, we all sin because our original parents sinned. Sin entered the world through them, and as a result, every one of us since then has been and will be a sinner. Is it a reasonable idea? Though the Bible really gives us no information as to how a bent towards sin is passed on, it states loudly and clearly that all have sinned, Romans 3.23. It is definite on the fact that all of us will sin. It's inevitable. 
Of all of Christianity's claims, this is one that should be indisputable when we look around. How could anyone have any knowledge of history and still come up with the philosophy that humanity is basically good? Even the segment of the population we suppose to be the most pure and the most innocent isn't. Could you name me an environment in which cruelty and nastiness and bickering and selfishness and me, me, me flourish any greener than in a school playground? But isn't that because of environment? Isn't it all learned behavior? The truth is the exact opposite. Me, me, me is the most natural thing in the world to us. That old self-will asserts itself from the very youngest ages. I saw the truth of it yesterday in living color with a mother and her little girl who was about two. The mother was trying to teach her little daughter to say please for something she really wanted. I know the little girl was perfectly capable of saying please. Her mother was prompting her in the request for the coveted item and the little girl could repeat the rest of the request just fine. But the bone of contention was the please and she locked her lips tight when she got to that please. The toddler ended up giving up the toy she wanted because she exchanged it for the greater pleasure of exerting her little will and showing her mother that she was going to be in control of herself. You're not the boss of me. Interesting how it all comes down to that decision of the will, of this matter of who will be in control, and how early that battle starts. Can you imagine any adult in his right mind teaching a toddler the word mine? Where do kids pick up this word? Yet, why is it always one of the first words a kid learns? Close second, right after the word no. It's unselfishness that has to be trained into us, and those who aren't trained in any direction do not end up unselfish. And yet, some claim that we're born basically good and learn to be bad from our environment. Remember that our environment is just the product of us. I understand why we want to think that kids are innocent little creatures, I would say that they do have a special place in God's heart. They are specially lovable in their total openness and their total defenselessness, and they're just so totally cute. But I don't think I could agree that they're also so totally sinless. Like it or not, they are just littler, cuter versions of you and me, and I know what I am. So if we acknowledge some kind of sin nature that rears its ugly head very early in life, the question stands, why are we judged when we're not to blame? I'm not sure that I could quite agree that not being able to help what we are and not being able to blame for it are quite the same things, but let's leave that question alone for the moment. Let's suppose that we really are not to blame for what we do. Does it still follow that we could call God unloving or unfair for sending us to hell for it? Let's go back to the illustration of mice and mosquitoes and other undesirables. Let's suppose another ridiculous supposition. Let's suppose I had created mosquitoes. In some lab somewhere, I'd put together this little creature and started off the whole species. Let's say I'd done it for some good purpose, but it hadn't happened. The only result was mosquitoes as we know mosquitoes. So I was the one responsible for this torment of all mankind, results ranging from uncontrollable scratching to death by malaria. Now let's also pretend that I had the means at my disposal of their disposal. If I chose, I had it in my power to wipe out every mosquito absolutely. Would I be unjust or unloving to do it? I have to tell you that I probably wouldn't hesitate. Even though I didn't create mosquitoes, if I could destroy them all outright, I don't believe I'd stop to think about it. They'd be gone. Now there's probably some perfectly good reason they exist, and some part of the ecosystem would be violently out of balance if I wiped out mosquitoes, and the whole world would end up falling apart. But I know myself well enough to think I'd take that risk and just up and do it. As it is, when a mosquito lands on me and does what is in its nature to do, I don't waste a thought on justice or blame or responsibility or irresponsibility of the mosquito for its evil nature. Smack! That's my decision. You could call me unjust and unloving for a variety of reasons, but you have to understand that it's not a question of blame, it's a question of what I can tolerate. An intolerance for mosquitoes is in my nature, and an intolerance for sin is in God's. And supposing I really had made mosquitoes, I might feel very badly that they hadn't turned out how I'd hoped. I might feel regret and sorrow at their destruction, but being responsible for them, I'm quite sure I would destroy them. Could you have anything to say against me? The fact that I was their maker, that I had given them life in the first place, would silence all your objections. 
Can you see that God really does have the right to do the same with us? He made us. Whether or not we're to blame, we cause misery to him and to ourselves. He would have every right to destroy us and banish us from his presence forever, especially as we're not unknowing, unwilling, passive victims of our natures like mosquitoes are. We really do know that what we do is wrong. But God doesn't exercise his rights to do whatever he wants with us. Instead, he allows us to do what we want with ourselves. He allows us to make our own choices. If those choices lead to our destruction, he even allows that. But he does everything he can to keep us from that destruction. I looked at that mouse running across my kitchen floor and felt a twinge of pity because I was going to have to destroy him. God looks at us with more than just a twinge of pity to see us destroying ourselves. He looks at us with heart-rending compassion and love. He sees us in all our sin and misery and sickness and helplessness and longs for us. Longs that will just make the one simple decision that will give him permission to free us from our sinful, miserable, sick, helpless state. Those who point out that the Christian understanding puts God in the position of condemning us for something we can't help, forget that in the Christian understanding, God does his best not to condemn us. He doesn't ask much. He doesn't ask or expect us to get 100% on the test on our own. He only asks us to let him write the test for us. It's not a case of us being condemned for something we can't help. It's a case of being condemned when we refuse his help. And that is something we can help. All right then, once and for all, let's be finished with calling God unfair and unloving. I can believe in a loving God and a hell at the same time. What I haven't done is show why I need to believe in a loving God and a hell at the same time. We've gone through some steps to determine that a belief in a loving God is the most reasonable option, even as much beyond reason as it takes us. It really is the only way anything else about life makes sense. In this chapter, I was hoping to show you that a belief in hell is not a deterrent to a belief in a loving God. I suppose what I haven't done is show you why I think a belief in hell is necessary at all. I mean, I haven't gone through any steps to show why a belief in a life after this one is the only logical choice. I haven't, because the fact of an afterlife seems self-evident to me given the fact of a loving God. Apparently, it's not self-evident to everyone, so let's look at the reasons it should be self-evident. We've gotten ahead of ourselves. All right, let's go backwards to catch up to ourselves. Let's see if the horse does draw the cart. Let's talk immortality.